discrimination existed. People were judged by the color of their skin, not by the content of their character. From powerful images during the civil rights era to demonstrations on our streets today, our community is refocused on social justice. We're not going back, but we got to know how to handle that. And what we've read, we had, what we've seen, what we've seen lately, we held our, our quote. A look at our history and the hope for a better day tomorrow on this edition of Let's Talk Cincy. From WLWT, this is Let's Talk Cincy, presented by Western and Southern Financial Group. Put our financial strength behind you. The famed historian Lewis Henry Gates Jr. said the first step toward tolerance is respect and the first step toward respect is knowledge. Welcome to Let's Talk Cincy. I'm Curtis Fuller. Black History Month opens a much needed dialogue about the stories and contributions of black Americans. For some, many of those stories remain hidden. Today, one story of a Cincinnati family whose home was bombed when they lived in Birmingham, Alabama. Hate lit the fuse that sparked that bombing. Christmas, 1956, at the home of civil rights icon, Reverend Fred Shuttlesworth. Jatera McGee revisits the story. I want to tell the story of Birmingham. A story that's shaped Ruby Shuttlesworth Bester and the world as we know it. Her father, Reverend Fred Shuttlesworth, was molding the civil rights movement before it had a name. Take me back to Christmas night in 1956 and tell me what you remember about when your home was bombed. Christmas night, 1956, I was 11. My brother was 10. He had just gotten a cowboy outfit. We were watching TV and all of a sudden, boom. The bomb was between the church and the house. So the house went down on daddy's side. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., her sister's godfather, had been leading the Montgomery bus boycott for a year. We joined in that protest, and we were threatened that if we rode the buses, the house would be bombed. And it was Christmas night, 1956, our house was bombed. But on December 26, Daddy got up and rode the buses to integrate the buses. Back in the South, you had to break the law to change the law. The law was separate. Her family moved to Cincinnati in 1961, where her father founded the Greater New Light Baptist Church in Cincinnati's Avondale neighborhood. The waves her family created in Birmingham are part of what pushed them north. In 1957, 12-year-old Ruby and her older sister were part of a small group who tried to integrate an all-white high school. A news person was filming, and he filmed my parents driving up with us in the car to this mob crowd. As Daddy got out, he was beaten. My mother got out to help him, and as she got out, she was stabbed in her hip. My sister, in fact, won't talk about it. The brutal beating was followed by a years-long legal fight. Ruby Frederica Shuttlesworth versus the Birmingham Board of Education. You didn't have it easy. What kept you going? Well, the Lord. And then I had a daddy that didn't allow you to cry. You never let them see you be weak. You were alive for both, for the Civil Rights Movement and for the Black Lives Matter Movement. What were the main differences? Many, many, many more people that were not African Americans. What do you want those activists and those people who are protesting to know? I want them to know that they're doing good. First of all, they're nonviolent. And I always wanted to say if I could talk to the leader, because there's always somebody in the line that's going to act a fool, I just wanted to call them and say, when they start acting a fool, back up three steps. You're not with us. See, back in the days, we prepared for people that will come in and mess up the line. She says their struggles made them stronger, and the history her generation holds must be taught to strengthen the next. Our history as a people 
has been and is hope because we've been moving forward. Jatera McGee, WLWT News 5. Now, as you heard, Reverend Shuttlesworth and his family came to Cincinnati at the invitation of his friend, another civil rights icon, Reverend LaVon Venchel Booth, the pastor of Zion Baptist Church over in Avondale and one of the nation's influential ministers. L.V. Booth's story is also often overlooked in the history books, but his efforts helped change America. In 1961, Dr. L.V. Booth, Dr. L. Venchel Booth, made one of the most courageous steps in African-American Baptist history. That Dr. Booth, in organizing the Progressive National Baptist Convention, gave Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. a denominational address. The other convention had unwelcomed him. The Progressive National Baptist Convention and Dr. Booth welcomed him. Civil rights was not only his, his uh, a purpose for founding the convention, but it was because of all the infighting and so forth that was taking place in the other convention. And he wanted the uh, Baptist denomination to be able to move to be able to move forward to address the needs of the people. And the civil rights uh, movement was really a byproduct of that. Fred Shuttlesworth came here at the invitation of uh, my father to speak at the uh, Zion Baptist Church for the church anniversary. And while he was here, he told uh, Reverend Shuttlesworth, and this is in Reverend Shuttlesworth's uh, book, uh, about a pastoral opening at the Revelation Baptist Church. And he encouraged Reverend Shuttlesworth to apply, and he did. And of course, as we say, the, the, the rest is history. But Cincinnati really has its place in the civil rights movie. What, what do you think your dad would say about where we are in the state of civil rights, um, the role of the black church. What do you think his perspective would be in 2021? That that there is work to do. We, we've certainly made some uh, strides. Uh, the church is now going through uh, challenges because of COVID uh, and, and having to uh, view service uh, online. Uh, but I, I, I think he would be he, he would be pleased at the progress, but he would be looking at it from the perspective of that there, there is so much more to do. Talk about what you think his lasting legacy will be uh, in years to come. In uh, a book of his poetry that was published called Keep On Praying. And I think that would, that would, that's the legacy that he leaves with all of us. Through it all, keep on praying. L.V. Booth was one of the founding members of the King Center in Atlanta. The final sermon that he preached here in Cincinnati was done at his friend, Reverend Shuttlesworth's Greater New Light Baptist Church in Avondale. L.V. Booth passed away in 2002 at the age of 83. Up next, a firsthand account of the impact of the landmark Brown versus Board of Education case when Let's Talk Cincy continues. Welcome back. We're sharing another story of courage in the battle for civil rights. 82-year-old Virginia Denton was at home when she found out about the Supreme Court's Brown versus Board of Education decision. That ruling in 1954 said separating children in public schools on the basis of race was unconstitutional. Virginia tells us about her experiences. We weren't scared, but we were a little nervous. On the first day of school in September of 1954, Virginia remembers walking to Fayetteville High with her cousins Roberta and Elnora Lackey. It was her first year in high school and one that would make history. That year, seven black students would join more than 500 white students, learning together for the very first time. When they arrived, they were not greeted by an angry mob, police, or weapons. Waiting for them at the entrance were Mary Ann Sharp and Sarah Traeger, two white classmates Virginia 
would later call her friends. We saw them standing out there. We didn't know what to think, but they were so nice and they, you know, told us, welcomed us. It was a very different scene than some others playing out in the Deep South. Virginia says inside the classroom at Fayetteville High School, her teachers were welcoming. They were nice too, yes. They were, well, except for one, I didn't like her. She didn't like me either, but. <laughs> <laughs> what do you remember about the students at Fayetteville High, your classmates? I think it was in history class, yeah. We had this one guy that got told this little end joke. So, but he got suspended. He was suspended for saying yes, that? Yes, he, yes. But he got to come back, but he got suspended for a while. So they weren't taking any, I mean, you know what? They wasn't going to start that, taking no stuff like that. But outside of Fayetteville High, Virginia says the students faced a different reality. She says they avoided going to several nearby cities and towns after dark. We couldn't go to Springdale and be there up there after dark. We couldn't go to Bentonville. I mean, I think all those little towns were still kind of, you know, they weren't ready for us. But now we can go wherever we want. We couldn't be there after sundown. What would happen if some if somebody of color was there? Well, they probably might have shot them. You couldn't be up there after dark. Yeah. But we went through there. I mean, still, we just didn't stop, it, you know, in any of the stores because we've gone there to go, like to Tulsa and stuff. But, yeah, you know, just couldn't stop. <laughs> yeah. It was, it was kind of bad back in there. We couldn't go to Farmington. Um, well, it's just, it was terrible. Nearly 70 years later, Virginia still calls Fayetteville home. Her kids and grandkids, also graduates of Fayetteville High School. Soon, her great-grandkids will be too. Virginia says Northwest Arkansas is not the same community it was in 1954, but there is still more work that needs to be done. Some things have changed. I just hope everybody can be as one. I mean, we're all God's children. I think that would be a good thing. In Fayetteville, Arkansas, I'm Ify Ibo Simba. Up next, the story of another local trailblazer. I'll talk with Hamilton County's first African-American commissioner and now president of the Board of County Commissioners when Let's Talk Sensi continues. History being made in Hamilton County. Back in 2018, Stephanie Summerall Dumas became the first African-American commissioner here in Hamilton County and more history this year after becoming the president of the three member board of county commissioners. She proved most of the political observers wrong when she won the countywide seat. She told me she has a full agenda for a county of 800,000 citizens. The story is I knew at six years old uh, that I wanted to help others because I would see social workers coming through uh, in first grade and um, so I became a social worker. And so I just see uh, politics as an extension of the political arena and then feel, having the compassion necessary to make decisions that are important uh, in everyone's lives. I'm, I'm going to take you back to when you ran for county commission. Mm -hmm. Everyone had written you off. My faith pushed me through. Um, I'm also a survivor of domestic violence, so um, have had to be strong through that, which has made me who I am. And so I never have really looked at the money, the amount of money or the amount of prestige or who I know, but I felt it was a good time for people to realize uh, the heart of the person. People even said, that didn't know me when they saw my signs with my pictures, they, the eyes are the windows to the soul. And they said, well, you know, she might she might be okay. So uh, people were doubting us, as, as you say, we had $460. And uh, the uh, majority of that went for signs. And uh, people said, oh, well, well, if she wins the primary, as you know, it'll be a, it'll be a miracle. Uh, we went on and we only had five people on our team. Uh, for the whole county of eight, over 800,000 people. Uh, but uh, we were strategic. 
And so uh, they said, well, she won't win the general. And if she does, it'll be a miracle of biblical proportion. So I tell people when I talk, you're looking at a miracle. We have to talk the pandemic. Um, mm -hmm. uh, as we said, no one could imagine what this would do to every aspect of our life. It, really, the CARES Act funding was a godsend. Um, what would we have done um, from the federal government to help out uh, our county? And um, so we've been able to help out the, the people that were really impacted directly. Uh, we have not been able to help everybody out uh, for, for lots of reasons. We, we Our messaging maybe could be better. Um, but I think through the CARES Act and helping the homeless, the small businesses, um, and helping, uh, of course, with housing, rental assistance, uh, we've seen a little light at the end of the tunnel. Going forward, what, what will be the priorities? Uh, assuming that we come out of, and I, mm -hmm. I trust that we will come out of this pandemic sooner mm -hmm. rather than later. Affordable housing along with transportation. Now we uh, passed issue seven. And um, they are starting to work uh, to improve uh, transportation. And I'm gonna stay on top of that. Um, uh, transportation, is, as we know, is not adequate enough. And that's why people agreed to pass a levy. Uh, but you know, as we increase um, transportation, more people can work. They can be independent. They don't have to have a handout. So transportation is really important. And as I mentioned earlier, uh, the homeless really have a place in my heart. And when I, when I see you on the news, uh, you know, there's some homeless here and I'm thinking, oh my goodness, did, you know, we gave all this money uh, to um, strategies to end homelessness and they're doing a great job. But what if we still, not that we'll be able to eliminate every homeless person because some of them don't want to be in a facility, but uh, I just want us to kind of push it up a notch. Um, I just don't want to see as many uh, on the street as we see. Uh, poverty for me is just a, a big issue. We know there will be poverty. There will be those that are making less. But um, to make a, a livable wage um, and, if, and just more opportunity for jobs, as I said. But also the other area that I'm really strong about is reentry. Uh, we have all these people coming back and they want to do the right thing. Um, and some companies are just not acceptable to that. Um, and so they're like, of course, feeling frustrated and the, the majority end up going back. These social justice issues mm -hmm. that, that we wrestle with here in mm -hmm. the county, what would you say the role for the commission will be on those, mm -hmm. those topics? Well, I think our, our, our role is clear. Uh, to be in support of nonviolent protests, that protest is appropriate. There are many, th many, many things uh, that are not right in the justice system and other areas, employment, I've talked about all of those, but um, uh, not necessarily that we have to take the forefront, but that we um, let the groups know uh, the different groups know that we understand uh, your call for action, and there's def definitely a need uh, for action because silence is a decision. I don't think we need to be silent about it. And there is more ahead from the battlefield to the courtroom. The incredible achievement of another African-American trailblazer when Let's Talk Cincy returns. We want to hear from you. Email us your ideas at LTC at WLWT.com. Remember, you can always watch full episodes or get more information on WLWT.com slash Let's Talk Cincy. You can also listen to Let's Talk on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. We close our show today by sharing the story of 89-year-old George Stark. He is a decorated Air Force vet and the first black man to attend the University of Florida's law school. But on September 15th, 1958, when I went to the University of Florida, I didn't know what to expect. This grainy footage shows a nervous Mr. Stark on campus receiving his registration packet, a row separating him from his white classmates on their first day. 
I got to meet some of the, my classmates in particular, some of whom really were not my classmates, but I didn't know it at the time. Two of them were Florida Highway Patrol people. They had been assigned to assure my safety because they didn't know what to expect either, uh, except that my name did come up once in a while in, in Klan meeting. Taking back to the civil rights movement and for you, what was your activity involved with it and what do you remember? Take us back to Dr. King and what you thought of him. Well, he uh, gave my graduation speech at Morehouse and uh, I knew his brother from uh, high school. I knew a few of the people that he knew. Uh, so naturally I was impressed with what he was doing. It was a kind of a, a time, I, I suppose, that instituted a great deal of change, maybe more understanding later, uh, more appreciation for the impact of segregation on people. No justice! No peace! No justice! No peace! When you see the marches that take place now uh, in response to George Floyd's death or other, other incidents that have happened across the country, how do you compare what's going on now versus what happened back then? Well, back then, my focus was primarily on what was going on at the University of Florida and what was going on at other schools in the South. Although people can't blame themselves for what happened 400 years ago, there's still a legacy, and uh, much of those problems still need attention. You went to Morehouse, you went to the Air Force, you went to the University of Florida Law, you worked on Wall Street. You had some huge key roles in, uh, in a time where our country was, you know, one of the most divided it's ever been. Was it easy for you? Well, I wouldn't say that it was easy by any means um, because uh, finding the quality of employment that I was looking for was in fact difficult took a lot of time to get on the right track. Uh, when I was growing up, you know, there were limits on where you could go, what you could do. Today, um, they're more subtle. As for the advice he wants to give to younger generations? Do the best that you're capable of doing and uh, come out and be involved in the community, uh, work for causes that you identify with, accomplish as much as you can, learn as much as you can, and keep learning new things all your life. Mr. Stark was given the University of Florida's Distinguished Alumnus Award in 2009, and he was also honored in 1998 and 2018 by the Center for Study of Race and Race Relations. Have a nice day.